from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 346, recorded live Thursday, November 15, 2012. This episode is brought to you by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, training developers to work smarter. And now offering Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at gesturepak.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Herb Sutter about C++. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm here at Build. We're in Building 92 in Redmond, the Build Conference, and I'm in a, a room here called the Brain Box, and you can probably hear people milling around in the background. We'll call that ambient noise, and I'm sitting with Herb Sutter. How are you, sir? Hey, Scott. Doing well. Thanks for chatting with me today. I really appreciate it. I wanted to come and talk to you because I know that you're totally excited about C++. I've been known to be. You have been known <laughs> to be totally jazzed about C++, and I learned C++ in school. And I, you know, I grew up on C++ and then C Sharp happened and then I became a managed developer without even knowing it. I kind of mm-hmm. transitioned silently over to, to C Sharp. And now I'm worried that I've become completely like a, I'm, I'm only C Sharp. And I look at C++ and I find it scary. You know, and I think that there's a, there's a generation of managed developers that are kind of spoiled. And they may look at C++ and they say, why? Why C++? So b- before I even answer that, you mentioned you had used C++ in the past. Yeah, now absolutely. you've been away from it for, I'm assuming, say more than two years. Oh, yeah. The reason I mentioned that is because we still call it C++, but it's a very different language now. Really? Uh, with We just had the new C++11 standard, which was the second standard for C++. And if you're familiar with C++ before, you're thinking C++98. Is that what I was thinking? That's a really good question because that's in 1998 means 1998. Exactly. The, the, the last century, last millennium, depending how you count. Mm-hmm. And Bjarne Strustrup says it well, I think, when he says C11 feels like a new language. Um, on my website, herbsutter.com, there's a top level link to elements of modern C style, which is like a five minute read, tells you the top six or seven features that will affect almost every five-line program fragment you write. Really? You'll still notice it's C++, but you'd be forgiven if at first you didn't realize it was because there are so many convenience features that and power features there now. And there's much more than what's just at that page. But that gives you the quick overview of what's new and different and why it really does feel like a new language. I think the last time that I did C++ was just in that transitional point when people started using template libraries. And I think yeah. I remember ATL and STL and... Uh, you got a whole host of maps and sequences and cues and things that you could potentially bring in, and that made C++ feel like a different language. Yes. So, so the STL was adopted, the standard template library was adopted in the mid to late 90s, and so it came in the standard 95, 96, and then people started adopting it after the standard was published, and, mm-hmm. and that took a while. Some were faster to adopt it than others. It was really nice, and you could combine algorithms and containers very nicely through iterators. It was very extensible. So basically, you had N plus M instead of N times M, mm-hmm. uh, very much better than some of the, the uh, very hardwired, baked together OO style containers that people have done in the past. That was a big deal 15 years ago, but that really was 15 years ago. We've come a long way since then. Mm. If you have not seen modern C++ using auto, like C-sharp var, using range-based for loops, using lambdas everywhere, you'd be forgiven for not thinking it was C++ anymore, but it very much is. And we've added those features and much more, including uh, move semantics and other things that are very performance-related, to enable people to have a lot of the same productivity, but without sacrificing the efficiency. I mean, mm-hmm. C++'s cornerstone has always been, it's a systems programming language, get full access to the hardware and OS if you need it, but have efficient abstraction. So you're not talking at the functional, you're talking about classes, type genericity, and those things, but that you don't pay for what you don't use, that mm-hmm. it all optimizes away very nicely. And so that's been the hallmark of it. So you're getting those features not instead of efficiency, but in, in an efficient way also. I like, I like that, that, that phrase, you don't pay for what you don't use. And that's mostly true. I want to say the caveat. If you want to say strictly that's not true, you have virtual functions. There is overhead for V tables if you, if you don't use them, right? So there are a couple, or especially for, um, the, uh, the dynamic type info stuff. 
it's very rare in all of C++ that you get exceptions to don't pay for what you don't use. Right. And almost all of them were already there in C++ 98. But, you know, when I, I'm thinking about this and you're kind of bringing back all these terms in my mind that, you know, gosh, how long ago was that? You know, 15 years ago, <laughs> we were literally concerned about V table performance. Like, you know, you used a virtual here and I think if you, mm -hmm. you probably don't want to do that and you can get more perf out of it. But now we're taking things for granted. I mean, we've got interpreted languages running major yeah. top 10 websites. Uh, do I care at all about performance though anymore? Why, why, I've been abstracted away for so long, you know, yeah. even memory management I've forgotten about. So a lot of the time, you may not. Certainly, we don't worry about vtable calls nearly as much anymore as we used to. However, performance is still important. And the two places where it's most important is mobile, where performance per watt matters, and also in the data center, where performance per users matter. Like, for example, um, talking with Andre Alexandrescu, who's a, a well-known C++ personality, and uh, he wrote Modern C++ Design in around the year 2000, which really influenced a, a lot of the the genericity, uh, type genericity that people used. He now works at Facebook. And as a research scientist there, one of the things he's noticed is that Facebook, which had been programmed in PHP and other languages, has more and more gone to C++ for performance. And one of the things that he pointed out in a, in a panel we were on not long ago was very interesting because he pointed out just in passing, and then I called him on it and I really emphasized it to the audience. Did you notice that Andre just said the, a primary measurement is watts per user? watts power like watts w watts per user electric he's like literally saying like i'm writing some code and i'm thinking about electricity yes because that's one of your major costs in a data center uh, if you turn a, i've got on channel nine a, a yc plus plus talk you can find it uh, on channel nine i just realized i see it's got another round of views on twitter in the last couple of weeks uh it goes into it in more detail but i point out there uh some research and data showing why and if you look at a data center cost mm -hmm. power isn't actually the major cost that's a common misconception Conception, but it's the second biggest one. Uh, delivering power, using it, and then getting rid of the heat is the second biggest cost after the hardware. And those two things together, hardware and uh, the power, account for roughly 88% of data center costs today. So this 88%. is something that a programmer can fundamentally change the business. Exactly. Because if you make a program that is twice as efficient, means it uses uh, half the resources, you need half the size of a data center. You need half the size of an elastic cloud for that application. You need half the cost, roughly, because you immediately save out of that 88%, and some of the rest you also get savings on. Mm -hmm. So efficiency does matter. And it's interesting because as soon as you – and, of course, that's kind of obvious on mobile devices too because twice as efficient means runs twice as long around battery. As soon as you say the data center and mobile, that's what a pincer movement looks like. And because many of those same techniques now – matter in the mainstream. And we see that here at Build with all of those mobile techniques mattering on tablets because mm -hmm. what is a mobile device anymore today? I'm really confused by when people talk about a mobile device because PCs, laptops have been for a long time. Right. And that is clearly the direction that we're going with that kind of convergence. So all of these things matter more than ever. Now, having said that, if your biggest programmer cost, uh, uh, cost of your application is developer time, which it really was in the late 90s and through the early 2000s, a lot with enterprise apps and in-house apps, optimize for that. That's what languages that optimize developer time are for, and that will continue to be true. Uh, Microsoft and in my team, we love C Sharp and .NET. They're, it's a great tool that's good at things that C++ is not good at. We love JavaScript and HTML. We are built on C++. Mm. If you take a dependency diagram of all the teams at Microsoft, like what team depends on what? There's only one team at Microsoft that everybody transitively depends on, and that's our team. It's not even Windows, because, say, Xbox doesn't currently run on Windows. Who knows what will happen in the future? I don't know those plans, so I'm not being coy, but it currently doesn't. And if you even look at .NET, a lot of good stuff runs on .NET, but not everything. For instance, not the core OS. There's only one team that transitively builds everything. And that also means we just had a really, really busy release cycle because the Visual C++ team had to support everything Windows was doing, bringing up a new ARM target, ARM targeting for Windows 8, mm -hmm. bringing up a WinRT. All the WinRT stuff has been built in C++ and using the Windows Runtime Library and now more C++ CX now that that's available. So we're sort of at the center of things. Never mind that while the whole tablet thing was happening, GPGPU was also happening, and so we did C++ AMP. It was a busy release cycle for us. No pressure. Now, you, I want to slow you down a little bit because the audience uh, may not understand everything that you just said. 
I think you said a couple of interesting things, though. You said that you've got C++ running on ARM. So ARM is a yeah. target. So non-Intel, non-X86, non-X64 targets. Yeah. You also made... I mean, a, it's a, our compiler has to enable that for Windows and apps to build to run on ARM. Exactly. But then there's also kind of an, an oblique reference there to running... Uh, C plus plus code on a GPU on a on a on a graphics processing unit. Can you right. Talk a little bit about that because that kind of flew by there in that sure. sea of acronyms. Oh, that's and you know maybe not everybody's familiar with that. So the idea of that you have a coprocessor. Remember the days where we had a three eighty six and a three eighty seven. Yeah, well, you had three eighty six DX. Oh, yeah, right. And then you're yeah, you wouldn't want the SX, right? No, you don't want the DX. Yeah, so then and then you couldn't run Excel. Everyone told you. And then even 486 is allowed the 486, 487. But now we take it for granted that the floating point unit is integrated in your processor. Why would you ever have one? Did we ever, did, was that in fact a reality ever? Or was that just a bad dream that we didn't always have a floating point processor? Mm -hmm. Today, if you look at today's hardware target in the marketplace, virtually something like half on the order, on the close order of half of the installed base from grandma's PCs to corporate desktops of PCs of hardware have not just a, a good CPU, but also a compute class GPU already in the box. It's mostly being used for graphics to run the monitor. Mm -hmm. It turns out that that GPU isn't as general purpose as a CPU, although it's, it's gradually getting there. But people have figured out ways over the past 10 years to trick it into doing computation for you, and that's become its own boutique industry where now the graphics cards actually support that. And there's uh, standards like OpenCL, industry consortium standards, I mean, like OpenCL, and uh, NVIDIA has their CUDA software. And what we try to do is bring that to C++. So C++ AMP, Accelerated Massive Parallelism, if you must, is uh, all about how do I run a parallel for loop on a GPU? And we try to make that as seamless as possible. And I've got a talk on that also available on Channel 9. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if people can easily find that C++ AMP. And we announced that last year at the AMD Fusion conference because Fusion is an example of an architecture where the GPU, compute class GPU is right there on the same silicon, on right. the same die in the same package as your CPU. Now think about what, what C++ is all about. It's all about leaving no room for a language lower giving you full control to express everything you need to express, give you full access to the hardware. It was unthinkable for us. It went right to the core of our being that half the installed base has hardware available that can run certain parts of your application 10x and more faster, and you couldn't touch that from a C++ program. Mm. That spoke directly to the key value proposition and the key mission of C++. And so we felt we had to do something about that as well. Of course, the transition to taking advantage of GPUs for computation came at the same time as the whole tablet revolution. So our industry is a bit in convulsions right now, and it's been a busy couple of years. But those are some of the highlights of what we've put together. And we think C++ developers and more will enjoy it. And a C++11 makes C++ feel very modern and sleek. And it's, it's fast and as clean and it's safe, as clean and safe as many languages. And just and still always pedal to the metal fast. That's a really nice place to be and a nice offering to have. That more and more we see industry moving toward again. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to, uh, to to bring this quote in, but it's one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is, you know, don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. <laughs> That's actually a good quote. I haven't heard that. So, well, <laughs> you probably don't listen to the same music I listen to. <laughs> but um, there have been a number of, uh, of people who have said, well, you know, C++ has been sleeping. But really, it has been here for years. It isn't. This isn't a comeback or a resurgence. C++ and its popularity has remained. It's just not amongst kind of the, uh, what I call the text boxes over data crowd, right? The business developer, yeah. the web developer. You know, hasn't been doing that work. The the the, uh, the upsurgence of a of ASP.NET and of Node and of PHP and these kind of um, you know virtualized languages, interpreted languages, has been happening. Where has C plus plus been for the last ten years? <laughs> While we have been writing web pages and doing text boxes over data, what industries has it embedded itself deeply in? Well, I mentioned before that Microsoft runs on C plus plus. We're built on C plus mm plus. -hmm. That is true of every major company. It is true of every major industry. So I, I, it would be a mistake to point to, you know, the, in, people would often point to, oh, look, scientific and engineering. As soon as you've done that, yes, it's very applicable, but it's a pigeonhole. Mm, it is. There's Mars, the people Mars like rover. People like doing that. People like taking C++ and saying only smart PhDs can do C++. <laughs> well, people like to pigeonhole everything. It's, but it's a very horizontal language. In fact, if you think of the role C has played, the world is really built, if you I want to be crisply correct about it, on C and C++. 
everything runs on those. There is nothing in the world if software in the mainstream anywhere that does not transitively depend on C and C++ because C was very important as a portable assembler. So Dennis did a great job, Dennis Ritchie, at making that possible when people said it couldn't be done. You couldn't write at a high level. What was then a high level functional function programming, structured programming, and still target efficiently a wide array of architectures. Mm -hmm. What C++ has done is taken that heritage, that ability to be efficient on a lot of different kinds of hardware, mm -hmm. and added efficient abstraction. So really, there's very little reason and lots of, of, of to not use that and lots of good reasons to adopt it, to talk about classes, type genericity without sacrificing that portability and efficiency and that ability to say what you really want to say without a language that gives you some guardrails to make simple things simple more than ever now in C++11. But you can always open the hood. Mm -hmm. You can always go and change your own oil and and rewire the carburetor if you need to, because that's the place that we that we live in where you don't leave room for a language lower other than assembler, and very few people actually drop to assembler ever these days. Hey, this is Scott, and I am really excited about these guys. Uh, this is a special offer from our friends at DN Simple. True story, uh, Carl reached out to DN Simple to ask them if they wanted to advertise with Hansel Minutes because we like them that much. Uh, it was a kind of a funny thing. They didn't come to us. We went to them because we think DN Simple is great. It's a hosted DNS service that you use to manage your domain names. Prices start at about $3 a month for up to 10 managed domains. Um, you can also use DN Simple to register domain names, purchase SSL certificates. All of my domains have been moved off of GoDaddy and are now at DN Simple. I like it because there's an application on my iPhone. I can manage my DNS from there. There's an API that you can use. The best part, actually, is these one-click services. So you can register a domain, get it up and running in a couple of minutes, and then go in and apply services to it. So you can say, this domain is for Google Apps, and this domain is for GitHub pages, and this domain is for Posturus. And they know the DNS records and set them up for you. Even for something as complicated as Google Apps, there's like 11 different settings you need to create. They handle it all for you. So here's the deal. They've got a special 30-day trial. You can cancel at any time. But Hansel Minutes listeners get three months of free DNS service. So you go to dnsimple.com slash hm. Special deal for Hansel Minutes listeners. Just visit dnsimple.com slash hm. Hansel Minutes listeners get three months of free DNS service. Love these guys. They're so nice. DN Simple. Hosted DNS. Check them out. Some people will point to, to Google and their choice of like kind of three favorite languages, but now that is kind of breaking away. People are introducing things like Go at Google. Mm -hmm. So the idea that there are only three languages you're allowed to write at Google is changing. But they'll point to Apple that really loves Objective C, which is kind of a C, has a C plus plusy feel to it. But it's their flavor, it's their language. But then they'll look at Microsoft and they'll say, "Well, Microsoft supports all these languages." And yeah. you know, on the .NET side, you've got not just C sharp and VB, but also F sharp, and now you know there's Iron Python and things like that. Why don't we pick one language and make that the language, and all other languages be darned? Yeah, as some people have have said, well, why don't you, why don't you just pick one? The same reason, why would you pick a hammer or a screwdriver? Isn't one going to do all the work? Well, it depends what the job is you're trying to do. And by the way, I'd also like a saw and a, and a drill. And that toolbox, that idea that systems today, and this has been true of C++ developers for a long time, you don't use just one tool. If you use just one tool, it limits what you can do. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, remember I said portable efficiency. Portable efficiency and flexibility is where C++ plays. If you want to write an application, you're going to write the UI differently on each platform, obviously, because the UI is going to be different on Android, iOS, and, say, Windows Phone. But if you want to write the core guts of that application in portable code, there, you can do it in exactly C or C++ and target Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. You have no other choices. And in fact, C doesn't work so well. Well, C, C, I have to, C sharp though. I just talked to a guy a couple weeks ago that wrote a game called Stickman using Mono, which is doing an amazing job of allowing portability on Android, on, Android, on iPhone, on Windows Phone, on Windows, uh, and they did all platforms, all tablets, all platforms, 95% code reuse because they have an abstraction layer called Mono game that's just X and A. So they wrote to, the, you said writing the UI. They actually didn't have to port the UI. They did it all in X and A. Yeah. And so similarly, we have some, uh, some nice wins lately with the Unity engine. Yeah. Where, where people are able to write portable code. Mm -hmm. 
what I'm getting at is if you look at the list of compilers that Apple, for instance, supports, the languages they officially support that thou shalt not use anything else for iOS development, they're getting a little, yeah. a, they're, they're loosening they're allowing, up a little bit, yeah. but it's been, look, C, C++, Objective-C, we don't want to see nothing else running on mm -hmm. there. And you're getting a little bit looser, but that's what Apple supports. Mm. If you want to use third-party tools, that's great. But when you look at what the actual OS vendor supports, Google uh, has a nice experiment in Go, but they support Java and C and C++. We on Windows Phone support C Sharp, .NET, mm. and C and C++. If you take now a look at if you want to write a portable application on Windows 8 and Mac and Linux, again, you can have some portable frameworks but if you want to use the languages directly supported in those environments, C and C++, again, are your go-to languages. So if you care about portability and care about efficiency and support on all sorts of platforms, whether it's in the data center or mobile, the desktop, wherever you have code you want to run, mm -hmm. portability has always been a big name of the game. And you can have that efficient abstraction, not have to drop down to, to naked structs and pointers like C, mm -hmm. but have modern code that is widely portable and will run fast. And that's a pretty good place to be. It's not the only place to be. If you only care about one or two platforms, you have a, an engine that will run on those platforms, go nuts and use it. You'd be a fool not to. Mm -hmm. But then think about what the, the tool offers you and what your needs are and pick the right tool or more often the right set of tools for that job, not just because it's something that you used on your last piece of code. I want to bring this full circle because I want to talk back to the idea of users and watts and the thought that as a, you know, it's always a good reminder as a developer that you're not there just to write cool software. You're there to support a business. Mm -hmm. And then the idea of Facebook where they've got a billion users, literally they could it's tell not a, you. Isn't that crazy? It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's, I think they're working on their second billion now. Yeah. So they're working on two billion users and they're thinking that you could probably ask somebody how many watts, you know, like the lights in this data center are on and it's costing us this many watts. It brings up a really qu interesting question that then you take the pundits and the pundits are out Will there saying... Will you take them, please? Yes, yeah, take them, please. Yeah, really. Take my pundits, please. Uh, these pundits are saying... <laughs> there's a rap reference and then there's also a... Uh, uh, yeah, we're going... We're getting... We're going, our references span eclectic. decades. Eclectic, Very eclectic is where it's at, man. So these, these pundits are writing these articles and they're useless and they'll say, well, the iPad 3 has 41.2 you know, watt, kilowatts, hours, and their battery. Speeds and feeds. And the surface has this many. But the, the, the idea of like, well, here's, a, here's an arbitrary number in time that describes how many kilowatt hours that this battery supports but without any real discussion about the language efficiency and the efficiency of the... D does your mom care how long, how many kilowatt hours your no. surface has? She wants to know whether it lasts six or ten hours. Right. Because and I don't care also... if it's ten kilowatt hours. If it lasts the entire transatlantic flight... Mm -hmm. We did a good job. And it depends on the OS. So Windows has got smart. The iOS, Android have got smart mm -hmm. about power sipping and efficiency. The the whole stack down to the hardware. Intel's got smart. AMD yeah. have got smart. Uh, ARM has been smart a while, and now we've learned from them yeah. about power sipping efficiency. You need those pieces in place. But on top of that, mm -hmm. once you have those pieces in place, your app can still do crazy stuff, or it can be efficient. Yeah. And the... the if your competitor's app lasts 10 hours on that flight and yours lasts five hours, yep. that matters competitively. I was on a, a transatlantic flight recently, and I was watching, uh, I think she was a grandmotherly type on an iPad. And you know what she was doing? She was double tapping home, and she was shutting down the quote-unquote background programs. And every time I see that, it just kills me because I want to... You know, you know, you don't know me, but can I sit down and talk to you about what a you know a, mul a true multitasking operating system versus a cooperative operating system? We kind of solved this problem, but there's this persist. And now I'm seeing people here at Build trying to shut down what they perceive as background processes with their Windows Store applications. And I don't think that that myth of the background process is going to go away until we really have 10 hour full day battery life. Yeah. I mean, really that's what it is. And, and we've been trained one way and we need to retrain. I mean, when I first got my iPad, the first thing I thought was I was going to download some video or something from the iTunes store a couple of years ago. And the first thing I did was I thought, Oh, I better plug it in and keep tapping the screen to make sure it doesn't go to sleep. Duh. I figured it out after a day. Okay, that doesn't matter. It'll just right. work in the background. Same thing with any modern kind of device. A uh, funny thing about the iPad, by the way, I, I loved my iPad. I, I have to say the D, loved, uh, because I, 
I did love it. It was great. Mm -hmm. My iPad one. I loved my iPhone. I, I even did the uh, politically incorrect things in Microsoft executive meetings saying, holding up my iPhone and saying, you will take this out of my cold, dead hand, which fortunately didn't get me fired, but it was how I felt. <laughs> and I always will, will say how I feel. Mm -hmm. I've been running. Here, you can see this. Your audience can't. I've been running last year's hardware, a Slate 7. This is not a Surface. This right. is last year's Slate 7 hardware that came with Windows 7 I got from a Microsoft store. Just flattened it and installed Win8 Consumer Preview and then Win8 RTM. Haven't looked back. That was in April, and it became my – I was going to do it as an experiment, and within a week, it was my main machine that I used all the time. And yeah. I just sit at, a, at a, my desk at home or at work with three big screens, and it's docked or at a keyboard and mouse, or I'm sitting here just like I was before we started talking, doing email. Uh, on It's my favorite machine. Yeah. It is my favorite notebook a, a PC I've ever had. It's not a notebook. It is my favorite tablet I've ever had. And as we were doing the site we're going to launch this coming Friday, I'll talk about that more in my talk at Build on Friday. Well, maybe you can point people to it because they this is in the, uh, now in oh, the Oh, we're, we're now in the future. future. So okay, since we're in the, the future, you can go to isocpp.org, isocpp.org, brand new site with uh, lots of uh, sponsors and a, a new industry foundation showing the increasing, yet another data point, the increasing investment in Z++ across the whole industry. It's a really big tidal wave resurgence. And I think resurgence is a proper word, at least in awareness, but also in investment. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I did that, I wanted to test the site and make sure it looked great on all form factors from my phone to my big desktop monitor mm -hmm. and to I wanted to make sure the iPad worked. There's a few of those out there. Mm -hmm. So I went to get my iPad to try it out in portrait and landscape mode, make sure that the rotation worked and everything. Right. And as I reached for my iPad, the first thing I realized, this was around July, I'd had my tablet, my Samsung for uh, three months by then. First thing I had to do was dust wipe the dust off my iPad because then I realized I haven't touched it since I've had this tablet. And I never noticed. I never missed it. Don't which is which is something can, interesting, I think. At least that's been my experience. I think that listen, you know, th there is the thing though that some listeners might say that well, you know, you've just drank the Microsoft Kool Aid. Hey, I'm the guy who say, who p said politically incorrect things about my iPhone in executive meetings. Sure. I, I will tell what I will tell you, and I will tell anybody exactly what I think. This is my favorite tablet, and one of the things that I like about this Win8 tablet is I find myself using it as a tablet way more than I ever used my iPad. First, because it's one device. I don't have to carry a second device around all the time it's to do my, to that. my desk, my clamshell work. And my, yeah, I've been saying that since before well, it was uh, popular see, to say. I've got my Intel Ultrabook. I'm holding up my Ultrabook. This is the one I've been talking oh, yeah, about. Yeah. This is a three pound i7 Ultrabook. Touch and I use screen. It, touch screen, but I can also run Hyper-V on it. Yes. So I've got, gotta my, love it. My, I've got my Visual Studio, but it's not really the best, you know, uh, for running movies and stuff so i've got my ipad here with me uh-huh um but i've been looking at like the the new lenovo uh i think it's called the yoga yeah and it's an ultrabook but it flips backwards 180 yep. degrees and then turns into a tablet so this one here with the that has the cover you just fold it like a tent very similar to yeah, that exactly. except it doesn't have a keyboard built in like the surface does so i'm definitely getting a surface pro as soon as those are available the in a pro, couple of months the pro with the type pad I yes. think I'm going to need a real keyboard for myself. But the key thing about it is it's my favorite tablet I've ever used, and I'm using it more than I ever used my iPad. This is just my own experience, A, because it's always with me, and B, because I can be docked and using it, using all my applications on a yeah. big screen, and then just pick up where I was and sit in a corner and read, and just without losing my place and constantly be in the same experience. But also that you're a producer. And not oh, I'm consumer. a consumer. I'm a consumer when I sit and you read news, so. when I do my news reader, when I do email, a lot of it's reading. I take, I just undock this and put it in my lap because it's more, e it's easier, but I can easily seamlessly switch back and forth. And that is a really big deal. We're, we're in an election season here and I'm not sure, probably by the time that this is aired, we will have a new, a new president. We've got the pundits out there that are talking about, you know, all the different statistics and things and, you know, statistics be darned. But um, we are kind of also in another election season that you've alluded to a little bit. Yeah, as we were well. talking about this uh, just before we went on air, and uh, I was saying, you know, it seems like it just struck me yesterday. I think we're in two election seasons because we have the one election season where you're you're being wallpapered with ads and analysts and reviewers, and some of the ads are positive, and a lot is mudslinging negative ads, and everybody wants to see who the winner is going to be as as we record this uh, six days from now. And so that's one kind of thing. Personally, I just I wait for it to be over because I'm very apolitical. But, you know, this is whole election season. And I realize, you know, we have another one going on. Because if you look at, you know, the iPad mini announcement, the Kindle uh, Fire and the, the new Kindle uh, announcements, you look at Surface coming out, mm -hmm. you look at uh, at what all these different people are doing, and especially Google coming out with Nexus. 
And a lot of it, I, I'm glad to say the Microsoft ones I've seen are not negative ads because I, I look at Steven Sanofsky and he talks about how great the iPad is at what it does, which is exactly right. But I'm seeing some of the negative ads now on the Amazon side about the iPad mini yeah, and the I sniping back and forth. It's pretty and sassy. I, I, I think we're, I think it's, you know, it's like, Hey man, we're in an election season this holiday, according to at least as far as these four companies are concerned, because mm-hmm. everyone wants to see how the popular vote for tablets is going to go to seven inch tablets, bigger tablets. What's the vote going to be for operating systems? And uh, so it's kind of an election season in that way, mirroring this other one that we've got. And it's, it's going to be fun to see what consumers pick. And I think this, all of this is good because it's not one winner or another. It's choice and people can use what's right for them. That applies to tablets and portable devices just like it applies to programming languages. Right, exactly. And I always use my wife as the example and everyone uses the kind of non-technical spouse. I, mm-hmm. I've used the term uh, WAF wife acceptance factor to, <laughs> I describe, think that works for me to describe any particular piece of technology like my harmony remote control is like the greatest remote control my logitech harmony remote control has finally solved that 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 first world problem which was the i had six remote controls uh-huh. now i have one i was thinking of using one of those afterwards you're gonna have to tell me how it worked it is a joy because i hate my three remote controls my wife hates my friend, them even more go to my blog harmony remote control review it uh, you you program it on the web just dragging buttons around and you pick, you say, oh, I have a TiVo and I want to click. So there's literally a touch screen and I say, watch TV. And it goes, ding, 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 and it automates everything it needs to happen. So high WAF there. Now I've said WAF before and I've had a number of people say, well, that's, that's, it's not, it's not gender neutral. What about the husband acceptance factor or hack factor or the non-technical spouse? So I, it has been suggested to me that I say non-technical spouse. Acceptance factor, but somehow doesn't quite roll off. Spouse time. acceptance factor, SAF. That the should SAF. work. Yeah, so we'll use spouse or acceptance. FAF, family acceptance <laughs> factor, because your kids matter too, it's right? The, it's the set of all people who aren't me, <laughs> and uh, I really am interested in seeing like what do they want? Like, what does grandma want? Your posse, you wife? give technical support too. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm technical support for the entire the entire family. I run the domain, I run the email. When email's down, mm-hmm. I'm going to hear about it. And I told my wife I was going to install Windows 8 on the the kitchen pc and she said no way she said no way i'm going to wait for the next version she says i don't know what it's going to do and i don't i just want it works now so there's an interesting uh kind of interesting statement there which is the it works now but then mm-hmm. she's starting to see these ads on the tv and she's like well wait hang on a second i i kind of like the calendar app can you just give me that one app? It's, it's just like election season. We're being papered <laughs> with ads. Yeah. So it's funny. My wife is, is the last person who's going to let me put a beta of anything. Then I've told no, it's, it's out. It really is out. It's like, well, is it good? Well, you know, I, I like it. You know, I've got it. I mean, I'm not trying to sell her on the thing. <laughs> All I know is I want a calendar on the kitchen PC and that, you know, recipes and the stuff that she, she wants to deal with. So I'm slowly kind of feeding it to her, showing her my tablet, and then saying, well, I could put this on the, the machine. Because it's actually, the shame is, it's a touchscreen kitchen PC. It's one of the old, original HP Touch Smarts with two two points. But that's enough, because basically the kitchen PC is recipes, calendaring, email, the occasional browsing, and then maps. Does she use Touch on it now? Um, You know, she only uses Touch to pinch to zoom when she's looking at the maps. But intuitively... For her, touch isn't the thing. But then again, you know, I don't know. We're the mouse keyboard generation. It's going to take a while. But the kids, they use it for solitaire. Uh-huh. My, my four-year-old, he's learning solitaire, and he uh, a, mou- a mouse makes no sense to him. A mouse is a useless appendage. It's like, why would I poke at things with a stick if I can touch them? Exactly. That's exactly what's happening. So I think that uh, I may be one of these kind of get-off-my-lawn uh, old men at some point where, you know, I want my mouse and want my hotkeys. For me, it's hotkeys. For my kids, it's touch. It's going to be interesting to see how they uh, accomplish tasks in the future. And it depends what you're doing because touch can't do everything that a mouse can do or a trackpad. You want accurate pointing. You want a stylus or trackpad and mouse. And that's perfectly fine. You want to write with ink. You want a stylus. You don't want to be using a, a one of those, those uh, pens that really are like a crayon because yep. they simulate a finger. But it's what you're trying to achieve and in the usage experiences that are nicely touch enabled mm-hmm. man it's so great to use that in fact one of the big things i see coming out of this wave of products i don't know how other companies i, I don't mean any one but the entire ecosystem of companies that make laptops and desktops mm-hmm. how they're going to cope 
with the coming change in user expectations of being able to touch anything. Mm -hmm. Because I've heard more stories in the last month about people who have touched a Surface, who have touched a uh, Windows 8 device, including their notebooks. Yeah, I've been pawing at my non-touch enabled notebook for a while. Yeah, And then leave fingerprints on their Chromebook or something like that. Yeah. It's like, uh, people are really seeing how great it is. Because after all, I love that start bar. Even in Windows 7, I had a touch enabled notebook before this. Yeah. There's my start bar. I always pin my frequent apps to the start bar, and I just got used to just clicking them. And yes, you can say mechanically it doesn't make sense to hold your arm out like this all day, but you don't. You just reach and touch. Yeah. You do this all day long. We're designed for it. And once you do that, you say, well, why should I have to reach for something else, take my eyes away or my finger to reach for a mouse? Wait, look, there it is. I just yeah. want that, and it's so much faster. Funny story that I'll end on is that uh, my four-year-old, uh, they, they watch Netflix on the Xbox, so the four-year-old yells, Xbox, pause, and then he runs. Uh, but there was a movie I couldn't get on the Xbox, and I was instead I hooked it up to the iPad, and um, uh, I hooked up the HDMI cable, right? So I've got the HDMI plugged into the thing, and then I've also been doing AirPlay, throwing the, the video up there. Mm -hmm. So the four-year-old's like, Xbox, I got to pee. Xbox, Xbox, what is your problem? I have to pee. So he's sitting here screaming at the television because he doesn't understand why it's going to pause. And then he's like, where's the remote? Where's the remote? He sounds like a little old man. He's like, where's the remote? It's interesting because we are now seeing, especially with this wave of devices, and it's not just Microsoft, but right now Microsoft is kind of alone and the others are going to have to catch up. It's, I think this is good for everybody. We're seeing the second wave of the new, new user interface, the new, and especially uh, the new wave of mobile devices. Because the first generation was all about having a mobile device, the power sips and having icons and apps. This is now very much a second wave yeah. uh, that we're, that's leading the industry, and it'll be cool to see what all kinds of companies come up with products. I'm looking forward to consuming them all. Yeah, absolutely. I want to wave my hands in front of my monitor and move things from side to side. So you just want to be Tom Cruise. I do want to be Tom Cruise. Thanks so much, Herb Sutter, for chatting with me today. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.